I believed in Oslo because I imagined the Palestinians to be like us. I imagined their national liberation movement to be a national liberation movement just like ours. Mm -hmm. um, and then reality just exploded outside my window, you know, in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is small. Yeah. So from here, or from when I lived back then, when a bus exploded on Dizengoff, you could hear it. And so you'd hear an explosion, and then you'd know by the number of sirens if it was, you know, some, I don't know, fireworks, or if it was a, a terror attack. I supported the Gaza withdrawal, and I, and I still believed that in the end, their desire to improve their living conditions will trump their murderous ideology. But, but that was wrong, too. And now it exploded in our faces. So as you know, I wrote a book about the settlers, by the way, trying to understand them. It was not just, a, it was not just an attack on the settlers. No. Um, and, and I still don't share their theology. But I do share their political plans now, because we, there is, we have to defeat the Palestinian drive to annihilate us. It's not a Western-style um, national liberation movement striving for nation building. And then you go all the way back to the way they understand Islam. And, it's, and, and, and then you understand what it is that a terrorist is calling his mother in ecstasy, telling, I just murdered 10 Jews with my own hands, mom. Call dad, I want to tell him. So this is, the, we have imagined them in Western terms, and these are completely irrelevant. You know, the whole, the West is in a, in, in, a, in a bad shape. It keeps talking about the other, but it cannot imagine anything different from itself. It's completely narcissistic. Mm -hmm. So the other is just an excuse to purify yourself morally. They're not actual subjects, human subjects with their own agenda. And once you respect that they are human subjects with their own agenda and you realize how horrendous, inhuman this Nazi agenda is, then, then it's a serious wake-up call. How do you see the U.S. role in, in, in supporting Israel in that war? How is it now and how, how should, what should Israel be doing to maintain the relationship? with its key ally. I don't think that describing the behavior of the United States as support is very accurate in this war, although they have done a lot of things for us. Uh, but, but what is most dangerous to us is the U.S. policy in the region, which mm. Israelis don't pay attention to. They only consider it in bilateral terms. Right. And so the, the, what October 7th would have never happened um, if Biden would not have been elected. Because the policy of two, three democratic administrations mm -hmm. is based on the idea mm -hmm. that you need to reach an accommodation with Iran rather than defeat it. Right. This was the Obama philosophy, this is the Biden philosophy. It's, in a way, it, it's not a big exaggeration to say that this is a policy that's hostile to America's allies. Because the idea is, you know, both administrations want to pull out the Middle East. They don't want another Iraq. They don't want another Afghanistan. Right. And, but, but there are two philosoph philosophies for that. So one says that you strengthen your allies and they serve as your proxies against your enemies. Right. Um, and the other philosophy says that your, your allies are already your friends and you need to find accommodation or to reach out to your enemies. And so that leads you to think that your allies are actually dragging you into uh, unnecessary wars and you need to restrain them and show your enemies that that's what you do. Mm. And, and this is what the Obama administration did and this is what the Biden administration did. The Biden administration, uh, the very first thing it did was take the Houthis right. out of the terror organization list and then start selling um, certain weapons to Saudi Arabia, which was trying to fight them. From the first moment mm. of this war, the, from the don't speech, the don't speech was directed against Israel, not just against Iran and Hezbollah. If you remember what President Biden said, he said, if there is any country or organization 
which thinks to take advantage of this situation. I've got one word for them, don't. And we read country, Iran, organization, Hezbollah, oh, very good. Yeah. But the minute he came here, he made absolutely clear, it was even our press reported that in a puzzled tone, why does he, how, where did that come from? He said, don't dare escalate with Hezbollah, why? Because any escalation with Hezbollah will lead to the complete collapse of their Middle East policy, which supplied Iran with about $100 million since they came into office. Now they're trying to stop the war without victory. So without an Israeli victory, and there's a plan. And it's, it, and at least, you know, the, the chronic anti bb protesters are saying that they're coordinated with the White House. Right. They're saying that. And, and if I understand the plan, and the plan is something like this, Israel would be chastened by not winning this war. Something will remain of Hamas, but it would be weak enough to bring back the Palestinian Authority Right. And then a weakened Israel and a united Palestinian leadership would be ripe for American imposition of the two-state solution. Those good things that happened, the Jordanian uh, Air Force deploying against Iran, uh, the Saudis also doing a few things, that didn't happen without coordination from the U.S. Doesn't Israel need, in this long war you described, a U.S. coordinating role? It can't do it on its own, can it? But what happened on April 13th, 14th was terrible for us. And the United States more or less allowed Iran to attack us and said, you, we, you will fight this war with a shield, without a sword. Mm -hmm. It is unthinkable that an American ally would be left in the lurch like this with Iran paying no price. Iran changed the rules of the game. Now it is legitimate in these rules that Iran can attack us. And the Americans just said, according to what we know from intelligence, they said through the jerks, don't exaggerate. They keep signaling to Iran that Israel will not be protected. Now they're telling us that if we, if we make concessions to the Palestinians, then the Saudis will come around for normalization. Mm. And then we'll have a grand coalition against Iran. That's, that's a lie because mm. they're not, they're not organizing a coalition against Iran. They're not even organizing a coalition against the Houthis. Even in the, in the Red Sea, what they're doing is, is a, a protective umbrella for the shipping. So it's all shields, no swords. So your plan then to prosecute this long war that you describe is for Israel to go it alone, regardless of what happens in November in the US. Uh, no, 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 it's not because I think we have I think we have room for maneuver. First, because the American administration is lying to the American public about its Middle Eastern policy. Right. And if there is a war with Lebanon, which they're trying to prevent, there's a good chance that they won't be able to maintain their policy, which confusingly they call regional integration. Who, who are they integrating? Right. It's, they're integrating Iran. But if there's a direct war with Hezbollah, you can either expose yourself as supporting Iran against Israel, which would be extremely unpopular with the American public, or admit failure and, and change your policy. Does Israel have the size of the military to both uh, occupy Gaza, engage in a war in Lebanon, and, and do other things to deter Iran? Does it have the force structure itself to do that? No, not yet. Um, these same generals who are still running the show have for 20 years prepared the wrong army for the wrong mission. They've cut down on ground forces, which we now desperately need, especially armor. Mm -hmm. And they had a philosophy that technology will solve everything. They also had a defensive philosophy that we will hide behind technological walls and they can never penetrate it. And they should have known from any serious study of, of military theory, defense cannot win wars. Defense, in the end, no wall of China will protect you because you sink into routine and the enemy studies it and in the end knows your vulnerabilities. 
And that's what happened on October 7th. So well, we need to plan our steps carefully vis-a-vis -vis the United States, vis-a-vis -vis other powers too. Mm -hmm. um, we need to change our, our lines of supply. We need to manufacture our ammunition ourselves. And we need to get used to the idea that Israel will not be able to maintain a Western standard of living in the foreseeable future. We will ha if we are to survive this, um, we, need, we need to be an armed nation and we need to completely change our frame of mind. And this is why, in a way, I'm optimistic despite what I told you about the completely corrupt military establishment, which is not up to the task, which is still trying to find a way to promote the two-state solution, which will never fly with an Israeli electorate, never, never again. Nobody, right or left, is going to put their children near a border where on the other side you think are people like the Hamas uh, terrorists. And it doesn't matter if they call themselves a Palestinian authority or they call themselves Hamas. We now know that the majority of Palestinians in both regions are happy and proud of what happened on October 7. And if it doesn't matter if you're a leftist and you're going to live in Kfar Saba, Will you put your children in a bedroom that's five minutes away from a, from, from Road yeah. 6 and Kalkilia? Yeah. Then, then the answer is probably no. Israelis want to pursue this war to the end. If the American administration thinks that it will move Netanyahu and then get a moderate government, it's dreaming. Israel is moving to the right, and, and, and we will look back at this, the most right-wing coalition we ever had as a moderate coalition.